I'm Walter Bosley. I'm going to read a selection from The Lost World of Agarty by Alec McClellan. Chapter 4 The Strange Quest of Ferdinand Osendowski. Until the start of the 20th century, the legend of Agarty remained very much a legend. The old stories of a secret underground kingdom persisted in certain corners of the world, but evidence to support the claims remained as elusive as ever. Indeed, it might well have been expected that in the rational and materialistic new century, such a story would finally be confined to the realms of fantasy, a colorful tradition to be ranked alongside other ancient mysteries such as the lost continents of Atlantis and Mu. But such a supposition did not allow for the remarkable discoveries of two intrepid explorers who in the 1920s went into the vastness of Asia and their unearthed evidence about a Guardi which far exceeded that of any previous reports. Their accounts indeed became the cornerstone of our present knowledge of the secret kingdom. Strangely, neither man knew the other, certainly they never met, nor did they ever read each other's books. Yet both were of Russian extraction, both were men of courage and wisdom, and neither was easily convinced of falsehoods or taken in by wild stories. One made his discoveries about Agarty while fleeing for his life from the terror of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The other came shortly after from self-imposed exile in America, seeking to penetrate the mysteries of Tibet, that remote and mysterious kingdom deep in the Himalayas into which few Westerners had ever penetrated. Their names were Ferdinand Osendowski and Nicholas Rourke, and it is their major contributions to this story which we shall consider next. Ferdinand Osendowski was a remarkable man by any standards, and it is somewhat difficult to explain why he is so sadly neglected today, his name recorded in so few reference works and his books forgotten and of the utmost rarity. As we shall see, this is in stark contrast to his fellow explorer of the Agarty legend, Nicholas Rorick. Ossendowski was born in Vitebsk in 1876. From his childhood he demonstrated a passionate love for his native Siberia, in particular its history and wildlife. During school days he proved to be an intelligent and alert scholar, showing a great aptitude for both geography and geology. Naturally enough, this led to his entering on a career in mining, and by the beginning of the new century he was widely regarded as one of the leading experts on gold mining in Siberia. He was also something of a rebel and an idealist. By 1905 he had become noticeably disillusioned by the Tsar's central government in Moscow, which seemed to him to be paying scant regard to the needs of his beloved Siberia. Osendowski therefore became involved in an attempt to obtain partition for Siberia from the rest of Russia, serving as a leading member of a group who called themselves the Far Eastern Revolutionary Government, with their headquarters in the town of Harbin. It was a passionate but ill-conceived attempt at defying the Tsar's mighty power and was quickly squashed. Osendowski, along with 37 others, was arrested and put on trial. Although friends offered to help Osendowski himself to escape, he preferred to stand trial with his friends and was summarily sentenced to death for treason. However, following powerful appeals on his behalf, plus his undoubted use to the government because of his mining knowledge, this sentence was commuted to two years imprisonment. He returned to normal life in September 1907, a harder but wiser man from his grueling experience in a Siberian prison. In the years which followed, Ostendowski devoted himself to his mining studies, serving as professor of geology at universities in Petrograd and Omsk, as well as writing extensively on gold and platinum mining for Russian and Polish journals. During the period of the First World War, he was sent as a member of a special investigating commission to Mongolia, which, it has been suggested, was a front for certain spying activities on the government's behalf. In 1920, with the outbreak of the Bolshevik Revolution, Osendowski's life took its most dramatic turn. 
As a well-known figure in Russian life, a member of the bourgeoisie, and a suspected government collaborator, he w was a natural target for the Reds, and he was high on the list of wanted men when the revolutionaries overran Siberia. But he did not wait a second time for imprisonment and the possibility of death, fleeing instead to the wilds of Siberia and heading for Mongolia. Although he had no clear plan as to where he might go, he sensed that China would probably have to be his ultimate destination once he had crossed the great wilderness of Mongolia. Louis Stanton Palin, who later collaborated with Osendowski on a book titled Man and Mystery in Asia, explains that the Red soldiers at first pursued their quarry with relentless fervor, but suddenly abandoned the chase when they believed Osendowski to be dead. A mangled skeleton which had been savaged by wolves was found in the forest of Yenisei and had on it the passport of a Dr. Ferdinand Nosendowski, says Palin. As he was so well known and so badly wanted by the Bolshevik rulers, great rejoicing followed the discovery of his documents, and the news of the death of so well known an enemy of Bolshevism was spread through all the red organs in Siberia and Russia. End quote. But in truth, Osendowski was not dead. He had cleverly outwitted his pursuers. Palin further explains. In a struggle with a party of Bolsheviks in the forest, Dr. Osendowski, in defense of his own life, made a commissioner pay the price the latter would have exacted from this fugitive man of education, and being in need of documents more useful and less compromising than those in his own name, he simply removed the commissioner's papers from his pocket and left his own undesirable ones in their place." End quote. Although Osendowski was now free from pursuit, he knew there was no going back to Siberia. With great determination and skill, he made his way into Mongolia, narrowly escaping death at the hands of a band of marauding Hungutsi, or bandits, until he fell into the company of a remarkable fellow Russian, a priest named Tushagun Lama, who had also fled from the Red Revolution. He was a fascinating figure who went everywhere with a big Colt pistol stuck in his blue sash and could claim personal friendship with the Dalai Lama, then the supreme ruler of Tibet. In the months that followed, a great bond of friendship grew up between these two exiles, and each came to admire the other. It was from Tushagun Lama that Osendowski was to hear the first hints about Agarty and be inspired to investigate the stories and ultimately produce the first detailed modern report on the subterranean kingdom, thereby helping to substantiate the truths in the ancient legend. He called this report Beasts, Men, and Gods, and it is now a rare and much sought after volume. In telling us about his host, Osendowski wrote in his book, Tushigan Lama, how many extraordinary tales I had heard about him. He is a Russian Kalmuk, who because of his propaganda work for the independence of the Kalmuk people made the acquaintance of many Russian prisons under the Tsar and for the same cause added to the list under the Bolsheviki. He escaped to Mongolia and at once attained to great influence among the Mongols. It was no wonder, for he was a close friend and pupil of the Dalai Lama in Lhasa, amongst the most learned of the Lama, a famous thaumaturgist and a doctor. His influence was irresistible, based as it was on his great control of mysterious science. Everyone who disobeyed his orders perished. Such a one never knew the day or hour when, in his yurta or beside his galloping horse on the plains, the strange and powerful friend of the Lama would appear. The stroke of a knife or bullet or strong finger strangling the neck like a vice accomplished the justice of the plans of this miracle worker. End quote. During their journeying, Tushagun Lama told Osendowski something of the almost miraculous powers of the Tibetan priests, and the Dalai Lama in particular, powers, he said, the foreigners could scarcely begin to appreciate. Then he went on, but there also exists a still more powerful and more holy man, the king of the world in Agarty. For a moment, Osendowski was puzzled as to what his companion meant and pressed him to explain. 
Only one man knows his holy name, the Lama replied slowly and enigmatically. Only one man now living was ever in a guardi. That is I. That this is the reason why the most holy Dalai Lama has honored me and why the living Buddha in Urga fears me. But in vain, for I shall never sit on the holy throne of the highest priest in Lhasa or reach that which has come down from Genghis Khan to the head of our yellow faith. I am no monk. I am a warrior and avenger. End quote. Ossendowski, his alert mind fascinated by this speech, was just about to pour a whole stream of questions when Tushigan Lama jumped smartly into the saddle of his horse and whirled off into the distance, calling behind him the Mongolian phrase of parting, Sign, Sign Baina. The poor Russian was left standing in the settling dust, with his mind still whirling thoughts. King of the world? A guardi? What did the Lama mean? And where could this mysterious place be? In fact, Ossendowski had to wait several months before he began to get any answers to the questions which haunted his thoughts by both day and night as he continued his journey across Mongolia. It happened while he was crossing the great plain of Tsagan Luk with a small party of Mongol guides that the Tushigan Lama had left behind to see him safely along his way. Suddenly, one of the guides called for the party to halt. The man jumped from his camel, which immediately lay down without being told. The other Mongols immediately did exactly the same and all raised their hands in prayer, chanting, Om Mani Padme Hung. Bewildered by the sudden events and seeing no immediate cause for the men's actions, Osendowski waited until they had finished praying and then demanded of his guide what was happening. Did you not see how our camels move their ears in fear? The man replied after a moment's hesitation. How the herd of horses on the plain stood fixed in attention and how the herds of sheep and cattle lay crouched close to the ground. Did you notice that the birds did not fly, the marmots did not run, and the dogs did not bark? The air trembled softly and bore from the afar the music of a song which penetrated to the hearts of men, animals, and birds alike. Earth and sky ceased breathing. The wind did not blow and the sun did not move. At such a moment the wolf that is stealing upon the sheep arrests his stealthy crawl. The frightened herd of antelopes suddenly checks its wild course. The knife of the shepherd cutting the sheep's throat falls from his hand. The rapacious ermine ceases to stalk the unsuspecting salga. All living beings in fear are involuntarily thrown into prayer and waiting for their fate. So it was just now. Thus it has always been whenever the king of the world in his subterranean palace prays and searches out the destiny of all peoples on the earth. End quote. Osendowski felt a puzzled frown creasing his face. He had seen nothing of what the old Mongol had described, but his interest had been aroused once again by the mention of the mysterious king of the world. And, as he records in Beasts, Men, and Gods, he thereafter began to earnestly search for more information on the mystery of mysteries, as the legend of Agarty had become known in Central Asia. He analyzed and annotated many sporadic, hazy, and often controversial bits of evidence in an attempt to form a cohesive picture. For example, on the shore of the river Amal, some old people told him of an ancient legend which described how a Mongolian tribe had actually fled from the demands of the warlord Genghis Khan by hiding themselves in a subterranean country. And at the lake of Nagun Kul, he was told of a man who had actually found the gate to a guardi, gone below, but on his return had had his tongue cut out by the lamas so that he would be unable to pass on the information to anyone else. However, Osendowski's first really substantial account of the subterranean kingdom was given to him by an old Tibetan, Prince Chultun Bailey, who was living in exile in Mongolia, accompanied by his favorite priest, Gelong Lama. The two men spoke freely on the matter once they realized Osendowski's interest was genuine and sincere. The Lama spoke first. Everything in the world, said the Gilong, is constantly in a state of change and transition. Peoples, science, religions, laws, and customs. How many great empires and brilliant cultures have perished? And that alone which remains unchanged is evil, the tool of bad spirits. More than 60,000 years ago, a holy man disappeared. 
and a whole tribe of people under the ground. They went and never appeared again on the surface of the earth. Many people, however, have since visited this kingdom, Sakyamuni, Undurgegen, Paspa, Khan Babur, and others. No one knows where this place is. One says Afghanistan, others India. All the people there are protected against evil and crimes do not exist within its borns. Science has there developed calmly and nothing is threatened with destruction. The subterranean people have reached the highest knowledge. Now it is a large kingdom, millions of men, with the king of the world as their ruler. He knows all the forces of the world and reads all the souls of humankind and the great book of their destiny. Invisibly, he rules 800 million men on the surface of the earth, and they will accomplish his every order. End quote. To this astonishing report by his lama, the old prince added further details. The kingdom, he said, is called Agarti. It extends throughout all the subterranean passages of the whole world. I heard a learned lama of China relating to Bogdo Khan that all the subterranean caves of America are inhabited by the ancient people who have disappeared underground. Traces of them are still found on the surface of the land. These subterranean peoples and spaces are governed by rulers owing allegiance to the king of the world. In it, there is not much of the wonderful. You know that in the two greatest oceans of the east and the west there were formerly two continents. They disappeared under the water, but their people went into the subterranean kingdom. In underground caves there exists a peculiar light which affords growth to the grains and vegetables and long life without disease to the people. There are many different peoples and many different tribes. An old Buddhist Brahmin in Nepal was carrying out the will of the gods and making a visit to the ancient kingdom of Genghis, where he met a fisherman who ordered him to take a place in his boat and sail with him upon the sea. On the third day they reached an island where he met a people having two tongues which could speak separately in different languages. They showed to him peculiar, unfamiliar animals, tortoises with sixteen feet and one eye, huge snakes with a very tasty flesh, and birds with teeth which caught fish for their masters in the sea. These people told him that they had come up out of the subterranean kingdom and described to him certain parts of the underground country. End quote. Osandowski understandably found much that was puzzling as well as confusing in these two accounts. Nonetheless, he was convinced that he had come across something more than just a legend, or even an example of hypnosis or mass vision. More likely, a powerful force of some kind, evidently capable of influencing the course of life in this part of the world. Maybe even far beyond it, if he could accept all that Prince Cholton Bailey had said. By now, as the fugitive's path across Mongolia, neared the Chinese border, he began to make plans for crossing the frontier and then traveling by train to Peking. From there he hoped it might be possible to reach the West, where he could make a new life if, as he sadly suspected, the Bolshevik Revolution succeeded. But before setting out on the final leg of his flight to freedom, Osandowski had perhaps his biggest surprise. For in the town of Urga, he encountered an old lama who almost unwittingly completed his file on the mystery of Agardi. It was not, however, a meeting that began very auspiciously, as Osandowski relates in Beast, Men, and Gods. During my stay in Urga, I tried to find an explanation of this legend about the king of the world. Of course, the living Buddha could tell me most of all, and so I endeavored to get the story from him. In a conversation with him, I mentioned the name of the king of the world. The old pontiff sharply turned his head toward me and fixed me with his immobile blind eyes. Unwillingly, I became silent. Our silence was a long one, and after it, the pontiff continued the conversation in such a way that I understood he did not wish to accept the suggestion of my reference. On the faces of the others present, I noticed expressions of astonishment and fear produced by my words, and especially was this true of the custodian of the library of the Bogdo Khan. One can readily understand that all this only made me the more anxious to press the pursuit. End quote. 
Ossendowski was feeling rather crestfallen as he left the room in which he had been received by the chief lama. At his side was the librarian who had looked so fearfully at him when the name of the king of the world was mentioned. Ossendowski decided to have one more try at getting further information about a guardian and its ruler. He turned to the old librarian and asked if he might be allowed to see the Lama Series book collection. He also employed what he called a very simple sly trick on the man. Do you know, my dear Lama, Osandowski said, once I rode in the plain at the hour when the king of the world spoke with God, and I felt the impressive majesty of this moment. Much to his astonishment, the old Lama responded instantly. It is not right that the Buddhist in our yellow faith should conceal it, he said, almost in a whisper. The acknowledgment of the existence of the most holy and powerful man of the blissful kingdom of the great temple of sacred science is such a consolation to our sinful hearts and our corrupt lives that to conceal it from humankind is a sin. End quote. Seizing his opportunity, Osandowski quickly asked the librarian about the powers of the king of the world. He is in contact with the thoughts of all the men who influence the lot and life of all humankind, Osandowski replied. With the prince replied, sorry. With kings, sars, khans, warlike leaders, high priests, scientists, and other strong men, he realizes all their thoughts and plans. If these be pleasing before God, the king of the world will invisibly help them. If they are unpleasant in the sight of God, the king will bring them to destruction. This power is given to Agarti by the mysterious science of Om, with which we begin all our prayers. Om is the name of an ancient holy man, the first Goro who lived 330,000 years ago. He was the first man to know God and who taught humankind to believe, hope, and struggle with evil. Then God gave him power over all forces ruling the visible world. End quote. Osandowski pressed on quickly with his interrogation of the old lama as the two men walked into the book lined room which housed the library. Has anybody seen the king of the world? Osandowski asked. Oh, yes, answered the lama. During the solemn holidays of the ancient Buddhism in Siam and India, the king of the world appeared five times. He rode in a splendid car drawn by white elephants and ornamented with gold, precious stones, and the finest fabrics. He was robed in a white mantle and red tiara with strings of diamonds making, marking his face. He blessed the people with a golden apple with the figure of a lamb above it. The blind received their sight, the dumb spoke, the deaf heard, the crippled freely moved, and the dead arose, wherever the eyes of the king of the world rested. He also appeared 540 years ago in Erdeni Zoo. He was in the ancient Sakai Monastery and in the Narabanki Kuri. One of our living Buddhas and one of the Tashi Lamas received a message from him, written with unknown signs on golden tablets. No one could read these signs. The Tashi Lama entered the temple, placed the golden tablet on his head, and began to pray. With this, the thoughts of the king of the world penetrated his brain, and without having read the enigmatical signs, he understood and accomplished the message of the king. End quote. Osandowski could feel his heart pounding with excitement as he asked his next question. How many persons have ever been to a Garti? Very many, answered the Lama, but all these people have kept secret that which they saw there. When the Olets destroyed Lhasa, one of their detachments in the southwestern mountains penetrated to the outskirts of a Garti. Here they learned some of the lesser mysterious sciences and brought them to the surface of our earth. This is why the Olets and Kalmuks are artful sorcerers and prophets. Also from the eastern country, some tribes of people penetrated to Agarti and lived there many centuries. Afterwards, they were thrust out from the kingdom and returned to the earth, bringing with them the mystery of predictions according to cards, grasses, and the lines of the palm. They are the gypsies. Somewhere in the north of Asia is a tribe which exists and is now dying and which came from the cave of Agarti, skilled in calling back the spirits of the dead as they float through the air. End quote. For several moments, Osandowski said nothing. A profound silence settled over the high-ceilinged room. The old man had told him much already, and if he was to say any more, Osandowski sensed it would be of his own volition. 
His instinct proved correct. Several times the pontiffs of Lhasa and Erga have sent envoys to the king of the world, said the Lama librarian after another moment. But they could not find him. Only a certain Tibetan leader, after a battle with the Olets, found the cave with the inscription, This is the gate to Agarti. From the cave a man of fine appearance came forth, presented him with a gold tablet, bearing the mysterious signs, and said, The king of the world will appear before all people, when the time shall have arrived for him to lead all the good people of the world against all the bad. But this time has not yet come. The most evil among mankind have not yet been born. End quote. Barely had the old man finished speaking than two other lamas came into the library. Before Osendowski could ask another question or even thank the librarian, the man had moved silently and swiftly away. The traveler never again saw or spoke to that lama who had shed so much light for him on the mystery of Agarti. There are only two more points relevant to our story which need to be mentioned in connection with Ferdinand Osendowski and his book Beasts, Men, and Gods, which he completed and saw published a year later from his exile haven in Paris. The first was that the book appeared at the same time as another work, which was to have a crucial importance in quite a different area, though both books were later found to be linked by a strange, intangible thread. This was Mein Kampf by a young German named Adolf Hitler, who had dreams of being a king of the world himself. We shall be returning to study this strange association in a later chapter. The second point concerns another statement by Ossendowski about the enormous powers the people of Agarti were believed to control, powers which he said they could use to destroy whole areas of our planet, but which could equally be harnessed as the means of propulsion of the most amazing vehicles of transport. It has been suggested that this could be the prediction of nuclear energy and perhaps flying saucers. The other possibility is that it might be a reference to the mysterious force known as Vril power. Similarly, we shall be taking up this fascinating and intriguing possibility later. But what concerns us most immediately is the discoveries of the second man who went in search of Agarti. He was the world-renowned traveler and artist Nicholas Rorick, who also tramped the wild and desolate regions of Asia like his fellow countryman Osendowski, and by doing so, penetrated still closer to the heart of the mystery. I've just read Chapter 4 of The Lost World of Agarti, by Alec McClellan.